think a little over eight. We will start now. Nadeem Saab, is that okay? Uh, can, can, we, can we go ahead? Okay, Nadeem is not there. <laughs> He's probably stretching. But let me start, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, thank you very much. This is uh, the first webinar we are doing as a collective effort, um, especially post the transitioning of the regimes in Afghanistan. Um, let me first thank uh, Blostan Council for Peace and Prosperity, whose idea it was to organize this. And the basic idea being that, you know, somebody should take an initiative, especially uh, from a quota based think tank. And we are also then doubly happy that we got uh, Gul Saab to join us from another new think tank in Quetta. Uh, so I'm very, very happy and pleased for these uh, two to have joined hands. Uh, I want to thank Pite, as we all know, for uh, helping organize this and hosting this. And uh, quickly, uh, I'm just going to lay down the rules before I go into introductions. Uh, the rules for today's seminar are very clear. Uh, first and foremost, we will not allow Q&A when a speaker is, um, uh, is uh, actually speaking. However, you can raise your hand. To do that, there is a button to your right which says raise hand, either do that. And if you feel like you don't want to be seen or heard, you can actually type that question, address it in the chat section to Amir Durrani. And you will, uh, I will make, take note of that and I will uh, post that question uh, during the Q&A session. So first, uh, coming back to the, the actual reason uh, for having this webinar, uh, the essence of it is to, as you know, it's a provocative date, it's 9-11 and uh, God knows a lot of human beings have been born. And in fact, if you think about it, about uh, half of Afghans or almost 30% were born after 9-11 when it really happened in 2001. So today we sit at a very important uh, part, you know, position in history, and we want to discuss the possible impact the events of Afghanistan are having on the region, on Pakistan, and then especially on the province of Balochistan, uh, because of the large border which it shares, just like KP. Uh, we would also like to sensitize and hope that some of the decision makers, be wherever they may be. Uh, hear this and understand the points of view that are going to be presented. But in essence, we want the following uh, three or four questions. One is, first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about the impacts of the Af Afghan refugees. I know that this has not really started, but in a way it has. Um, and you know the amount of Afghans and uh, we don't know what is going to, going to look like. So we'd like the speakers to talk about that and particularly its impact on Balochistan. We'd like to also talk about, uh, you know, what will this fresh influx of refugees do to Balochistan's socioeconomic conditions on the province's demography? A very touchy subject to begin with. And we'd like to sensitize the new dispensation in Afghanistan uh, through this webinar uh, to basically understand what can they do to, to basically sensitize their population and make them feel comfortable uh, to stay in Pakistan. And also we want to talk a little bit about the role UNHCR can play. So with those, you know, I think the topic is, uh, is, we have tried to limit it, but we are going to hear the speakers. My first speaker, our former ambassador, uh, he's a distinguished career in the foreign service, Ambassador Asim Burani. Uh, he's retired from the foreign service. He has been our ambassador to UAE, institutions amongst which served in the region, including uh, especially Afghanistan and in Iran. Uh, our second speaker is going to be Brigadier Aga Ahmed Gul. Aga Saab has served in the army for 34 years. He hails from Quetta, Balochistan. He's done a lot of stints post his career in Balochistan, serving at very high level positions, and is the founder head of the Balochistan Think Tank Network in Quetta. And other speaker, third speaker we have is uh, General Samrez. General Samre Salik, uh, obviously I want to introduce him as a, as a teacher and as a friend also. Um, he is uh, essentially uh, one of those thinking minds in the military. His last service has been as the DG of the Institute of Strategic Studies Research and Analysis at the National Defense University. Um, his book that he's authored, Fighting Shadows, I think has been widely read. He has also holds a PhD degree in strategic security management. Our fourth speaker is going to be Sadat Baloch, who's the president of the Balochistan Council for Peace and Policy. Um, he is a, a very illustrious man. I will just highlight that he works on peace building and countering violent extremism. 
including community and youth engagement. And last but not least, we will have a voice from the Hill, Mr. J Dr. Jeffrey Stacey. Jeff, again, is a, is a friend. He has been a national security and development consultant and has advised many of the dispensations on the Hill. Uh, so with that, I will now hand over with an introduction to Fahad Hussain, who will be moderating. And of course, you know, I'm one of your hosts and so is Dr. Nadeem. So over to you, Fahad. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Amit Saab and uh, Dr. Nadeem, and uh, assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, uh, I think it's a very important topic that we're discussing today, uh, especially because there is so much of um, uh, fast-paced developments that are taking place uh, as we speak, in fact. Uh, and, and today, uh, you know, there's a very, very important meeting that, that, that has taken place here, uh, hosted by Pakistan, in which the intelligence chiefs of uh, eight countries um, have, have uh, joined together to discuss you know, what, the situation in Afghanistan. Six of those countries are those which border uh, Afghanistan. And then, of course, uh, in addition, there's Russia and, and uh, Kazakhstan. So much that is happening uh, and much the, the, you know, that, that's there to talk about. So an important discussion today, and we hope that we can, we can get some very important uh, uh, and perceptive points uh, from our speakers. What what we'll try and do is that every speaker has a uh, uh, has a designated time. So uh, my request would be for everybody to you know, try and, and keep within the, the time limit. We will have a Q and A session at the end, but um, perhaps we could even jump in at some point. And if the if speaker said something very uh, interesting, uh, I I could jump in and just ask a, a follow up question just to make sure that that particular point is well elaborated. So so. So that's the format, and then at the end, uh, once all the speakers have uh, given their uh, shared their thoughts, then we can have a Q and A. People uh, who are in this meeting can raise their hands, and and uh, you know they are welcome to ask questions. So with that, I think um, uh, let me introduce um, uh, Ambassador Asif Durrani, who's our first speaker. Um, of course, you know he's been introduced well. He's been writing and and speaking about the situation. Uh, um, you know, in a, in a very meaningful manner. So we are very privileged to have uh, him today. Ambassador uh, Asif Durrani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fahad. But let me know how much time uh, do I have uh, just to speak with? Uh, let's try and see if we can wrap it up in, within 10 minutes. Right. Okay. Thank you, Fahad. Thank you for having me this evening. And it's a very important topic. Uh, definitely, there will be an impact of our one sun developments on Balochistan. If you look at it from the very beginning, uh, if you date back to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, Balochistan received its uh, share of uh, one refugees who are still there. And uh, uh, according to uh, our statistics here in the Ministry of uh, State and Frontier Regions, there are still close to half a million refugees in Pakistan, uh, Balochistan. And uh, uh, beyond that, uh, there are uh, Awans who straddle Pakistan's border every day, almost without documents under the easement rights. So they do straddle and do their business or do the you know, jobs on daily wages basis. They are there. Then there are uh, semi or permanent residents in um, uh, Balochistan, especially in Quetta, they are doing businesses, they are into many businesses, but the informal trade makes the bulk of that business. When I say informal trade, so we take it as smuggling also. And Balochistan is one of the lucrative markets and transit routes for uh, the drug uh, drugs. And here in uh, then the officials of uh, Ashawani government, if I begin from that, to our uh, law enforcement agencies, and then Iranian uh, IRGC, or uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or Pastaran. So they were the beneficiaries of uh, this drug trade. I'm not sure what will happen to the drug trade now, reason being that uh, uh, drugs made the bulk of Afghanistan's informal income. It was close to $50 billion trade in the European market, 10% of which would return to Afghanistan, i.e. $5 billion. And who's who of Afghanistan were the beneficiaries, including the Taliban. Their latest figure was $400 million from the drug trade. 
and um, and then another 400 million they would earn from the minerals then uh, uh, remaining 200 million dollars uh, they would earn from uh, different uh, toll taxes they would levy on natural forces and other uh, one uh, traffic uh, to and fro uh, from Kandahar to Kabul to Herat and to Mazar Sharif. Uh, but not in Mazar Sharif at that point of time, North was not, not in their control, but uh, uh, Greater Kandahar and uh, Eastern regions, including the Punar and uh, those regions were under their control. They also controlled the, the, the timber smuggling and so in a way, they, their income was $1.6 billion in, uh, as per the 2020 estimates. Now situation has changed, I mean, uh, but at this, uh, we should also not forget that during the past two decades after the 9-11, uh, Weinstein served as a launching pad uh, for uh, disturbancing in uh, Balochistan as well as in uh, erstwhile uh, Pata area and that had negative impact on Pakistan. And then uh, we shouldn't also forget that perhaps what has happened in Afghanistan, Americans have left, but their imprint is very much there and death and destruction is also there and it's likely to increase with passage of time if Afghanistan continues to be under sanctions. Uh, because in that case, then we should expect a mass influx of people Already our trickling down has started. Luckily, uh, since situation in Afghanistan has been under control after the American withdrawal. So there are no, uh, at least uh, uh, we don't see uh, chances of civil war for the time being, but you never know. We are talking about Afghanistan and uh, they are the forces, uh, they can regroup uh, very, uh, I mean, uh, very quickly and uh, then uh, uh, at least during the past two centuries this is what has happened that when uh, an established order was uh, deposed uh, the new order came but it took a while and then uh, the rival groups reassembled uh, this is what the british were doing this is what uh, we are like to face even now and um, i have no uh, uh, doubt that uh, rival groups who are right now lying low, they may resurface. So here we will have twin uh, challenges. One that uh, once now right now under the Taliban, uh, Prama Fasai looks quite facile, quite peaceful and under the control. But at the same time, the simmering uh, unrest are likely there. Panjshir may have gone, they may establish control. But if the statistics are correct, with 75,000 Taliban controlling uh, a country, two thirds of Pakistan's uh, geography, and um, uh, a population of 35 million would be a gigantic task, especially if uh, uh, there are groups or ethnic groups or uh, religious minorities, if they take up arms and uh, challenge the Taliban rule. So we should be prepared for that. A uh, third aspect uh, would have direct impact on Pakistan, and that would be, as I have said earlier, would be the uh, influx of refugees. So, of course, with 2,600 uh, 2, uh, kilometers of borders, Taliban are likely to, uh, I'm sorry, these refugees are likely to come to Pakistan. While we may have the fencing, still the challenges are there. It's possible that uh, people may pass. If, even if we don't allow, we force uh, them not to come to Pakistan, it can become an international scandal. We are already under the microscope, so we have to be mindful of that fact as well. Now coming here, we we'll say if uh, there are more refugees, uh, let's say uh, hypothetically, we say from 100,000 to 200,000 more refugees in Balochistan, where are you going to put them? Uh, close to the one borders, which border? Now look at the borders, right? From Chaman down, down to uh, Zahidan, uh, uh, Mirjaweh. And uh, uh, look at it where, uh, how the situation would be. And, uh, and then uh, don't forget that unless drug or opium is controlled uh, effectively, uh, we will have much more drug uh, peddlers, more drug trade in, in the farmers. 
and then socioeconomic uh, problems would be there. Already, I think our Baloch population had been restless before, uh, because they thought that the demography of the province would change if uh, mostly Pashtun uh, uh, Afghan refugees they come to Pakistan. Already, they have the bridges that in the Pashtun areas. Uh, the voters uh, lists have been manipulated and uh, many Afghans have been included in the voters list. So this is something which I'm uh, flagging right now. There could be other also problems. For instance, TTP is another, uh, or Sapai Saba, they are another veritable challenge for the, for, for the state. And uh, they can strike at will. <clears throat> we have not succeeded yet in controlling them. And then uh, Baloch uh, uh, dissidents and uh, insurgency at a low simmering level is there. And uh, to a greater extent, it is under control. Even then, uh, they can spring surprises, which they have been doing that. And despite the uh, Americans' departure, there have been incidents in Balochistan as well as in uh, Arthwal uh, uh, Pata. Uh, those and our law enforcement agencies have been targeted. So uh, I want to flag these uh, threats as well. And, and uh, the Indian element was there in Afghanistan. But uh, I'm of the view that uh, some of our analysts uh, thought that uh, with the US departure from Afghanistan, perhaps India uh, would uh, wind up its shop from Afghanistan. I don't think it will happen like that. They already have relocated their assets. And which is why I think one of the indicators are that those attacks which have taken place in Balochistan or in uh, uh, Fata, uh, those are there. And I think if uh, Indians are directly involved in that, so in, that shows that they have relocated the, the assets or the controlling uh, headquarters have been relocated elsewhere, uh, we can make our guess our intelligence agencies are in much better position to locate them and uh, to uh, take remedial measures. But I just wanted to uh, uh, make uh, uh, um, uh, a case for that. And lastly, uh, Awansan is a sanctuary for the TTP. We haven't got yet uh, foolproof assurances from the Taliban, Afghan Taliban, that how they will be dealt with. And uh, so uh, here lies the answer also that we have to uh, take them into confidence. And I think the government should initiate a dialogue with the TTP. Uh, if they are Pakistanis, so they have to. Same is the case with our uh, disgruntled Baloch youth who have taken up arms. There's a need to. Uh, address that issue also and uh, but uh, the solution should not be customized uh, in uh, uh, Islamabad. It should evolve from uh, within uh, Balochistan and that is that has the chances of durable uh, you can say solution and which can bring about peace. It should not be thrust from Islamabad. I'll stop here and then I'll welcome questions. Thank you for Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Rani. Uh, actually, uh, if, if you allow me, just a quick thing. The impact on, um, on Balochistan, of course, you know, specifically in terms of refugees, what we've seen so far, Ambassador, is that the, the, the number of refugees coming in is nowhere close to what was feared. Is that a fear? Is that a concern uh, which could... Uh, get a bit worse in the coming days? I mean, what is your assessment in terms of uh, the refugee inflow? I don't know how we take the intensity of the numbers, but my information, as well as my information goes, uh, almost already 50,000 refugees have uh, entered Balochistan uh, from the Chaman border. So uh, we can uh, then uh, discuss it further if uh, there's room for discussion specifically for the refugees, yes. Okay, great. 
Thank you, Master. Our next speaker is um, uh, Brigadier Aga uh, Ahmed Gulsab, who is the CEO of Lutusan Think Tank Network. Floor is yours, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Can you hear me now? G. G, please. Can you hear me? We All can right. Hear you. All right. Thank you. I'm saying that when the events are as close as 15th of August, then crystal gazing and looking into future is at best very hazardous proposition. What I've tried to do is keeping the time in mind. I've noted down some points, so allow me to just rush through them. After that, you can ask questions and I should be able to ask, answer the questions. And of course, in my comments, I'll also be including what uh, Mr. Amir Durrani wanted, recommendations for government of Pakistan and Pakistan. Uh, my first presentation to you would be, what is the emerging geostrategic environment? And in that, I take United States first. And the question which is bugging me is, and probably the most significant question, has the US with its myriad allies actually evacuated Afghanistan? Now, I went through quite a bit of argument in my own mind. I won't share that with you because I don't have the time. But the question that have they actually evacuated Afghanistan does not seem to be uh, so simple to answer. The answer is no, they haven't. And the statements of Mr. Blinken, the list of do's and don'ts, which he keeps reiterating, suggesting that they will want Afghanistan to dance on their tunes, despite knowing that the Taliban will not. Therefore, our sword would keep hanging on the regime of the Taliban whether today or some months from today. And the answer therefore that I give is that the US has not vacated Afghanistan. US will keep its presence in the shape of ISIS, which even Ahmed Karzai said was planted on the choppers, unmarked choppers into the Afghanistan. Mercenaries, as you know, Prince Eric or Eric Prince, long live, he's there, as well as powerful intelligence operatives which are operating in the country. It will also likely to generate uh, sir, we have lost you. Can you please? Uh... Are you there? I think we've lost the connection. Afghanistan mission. Okay. Sir, by greedy sub connection, internet connection for us stable. Okay, can we let me call him and also uh, yeah. about no, that? Uh, your, your mic is mute, Brigadier sir. Okay, this machine is playing tricks. I'm trying. Am I audible now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, gentlemen, I was saying that unless a change of heart occurs and America realizes what have they done to Afghanistan, much needed something like Marshall Plan post World War II type rebuilding. If they launch it, it will certainly change Afghanistan and bring much needed peace and prosperity to the entire nation. Now, a few words about the geostrategic environment because of the regional states. Russia, China, Central Asian states, Iran, and of course, Pakistan will directly influence the geostrategic environment of Afghanistan. They all can help stabilize Afghanistan and perhaps even convince United States to let bygone be bygone. The United States ought to rise to their self-proclaimed exceptionalism for the peace and well-being also, except, except the Afghanistan sovereignty and help Afghanistan rebuild. 
the regional states should also help Afghanistan financially at top priority. Pakistan in particular, without attaching any strings. I like to say a few words about internal dynamics of Afghanistan. First of all, let me say a few words about the governance, which is appearing to be showing on the horizon. The formation of Taliban's first cabinet, although they haven't sworn it as yet, is a step towards the right direction. Afghan society is multi-ethnic, as you know, and multi-racial. Importance of national reconciliation just cannot be overemphasized. The Taliban-led government should indeed be an inclusive coalition government. Some friendly states might suggest to them to bring in the minorities and some accomplished women in the cabinet also. They should try to learn from Nelson Mandela's peace negotiations and reconciliation model of governance. Probably this will help in due course of time. Political uncertainty, witch hunting, and violence, if launched, will terribly suppress economic activity across the border. And then I think all the surrounding countries will pay by a huge rush of the refugees. Now a few words about economy. Afghanistan was primarily surviving on war economy, which has suddenly dried up. Besides, I know that Afghanistan central bank's assets in the United States are also frozen. All neighbors must take steps to prevent economic meltdown in Afghanistan. If economic stability is assured and humanitarian crisis is prevented, then peace can be consolidated and a mass exodus precluded. Pakistan currency is used, freely used in Afghanistan. Pakistan is best suited to loan an amount, possibly a hundred billion rupees to Afghanistan Central Bank. And just say, we will decide how you would return in a year's time or maybe through barter. I think the trade between Pakistan and Afghanistan, legal and illegal, for a time being, customs should look the other way and let that go on. This trade will help Afghanistan survive. Otherwise, a huge rush of refugees, we should be mentally prepared to accept. The Taliban have forbidden poppy cultivation, which will also adversely affect the economy. And I have no doubt that when they forbid it, they will forbid it and they will see to it that it does not take this. This will add to the economic hardships. And finally, Pakistan, like Pakistan, has been suffering for some years by terrible drought. Its effect will also accentuate all the negatives. I also feel the government should tell the SCO that they should come forward and help Afghanistan. Pakistan has very limited capacity to help. A stable and prosperous Afghanistan is in everybody's interest. Most of all, Pakistan, of course, as we share most things with them. But all regional countries owe it to our liberated neighbor to be mindful of it. Now, as I got Blochistan, just a few words. Gentlemen, the general feeling in Blochistan is good. Guarded though. This feeling of satisfaction and happiness prevails primarily as the American forces have vacated Afghanistan and we hope they do not come back on one pretext or another. Afghanistan has suffered very much and many in Afghanistan blame Pakistan for its woes, which is not true actually. But Pakistan has also suffered heavily due to two successive invasions of Afghanistan. In both the invasions, we suffered badly. We are aware of our massive losses due to Afghanistan's occupation. I think it is incumbent on our government and on our media to make Afghanis aware of the sufferings that Pakistanis have gone through. Anti-Pakistan forces in Afghanistan have been running almost a cottage industry to malign Pakistan and provide safe havens for launching terror attacks in Blochistan. There's a general feeling that Taliban regime will not allow it. It's a happy feeling. It is in Pakistan's vital interest that Afghanistan stabilizes, peace prevails, and no safe havens are allowed to exist in Afghanistan, which can launch periodic terror attacks in Blochistan. Now, as regard the new wave of refugees is concerned, Asif just mentioned a figure I'm not aware of uh, data, 
But of course, I will say that no mass exodus of refugees has taken place in Blochstan as yet. Nevertheless, some refugees have entered Blochstan, but everyone seems to be staying with their families. Bloch militants, some said they were 15,000, have also stealthily moved in, and I'm told that they have reached as deep as Panjgur and in the interior. And if their logistics dry up, uh, CIA and draw are not there to replenish their weapon systems and give them money and food, then probably they will reintegrate into the province and peace will not be disturbed. As regards Pashtun refugees, I do not know the numbers, but reportedly many have entered Lutstan. They are living with their families, some old, some settled during the last 40 years of foreign invasions. There is no friction so far as Pashtuns are concerned. Of course, our Bloch brothers keep saying that uh, electoral roles will change, but this is the writing of the history. Nobody can reverse it. Um, Blochistan will do well to offer some help in kind, preferably to ease the stress on the nearby posts or get some reliable data of the new refugees arriving in Blochistan, seek help from UNHCR. I was very saddened to hear two days ago when I heard the 200 families which had landed near Bushlar were uh, by the civil authorities pushed back across the border. Now, these are the people who were mostly children and women and all they were carrying, I'm told, was just one tent. They had nothing actually. I think it was very heartless for us to push them back. Our problems notwithstanding, I think we need to be mindful of this. They are our neighbors. And uh, amongst the Muslims, uh, I believe our prophet, peace be upon him, said, the only thing which is not allowed is part of your property. Otherwise, your neighbor has a right over everything that you have. One more thing has taken place. Dollar value in Pakistan has risen, partly because people who are coming from Afghanistan, they are converting into dollars, some for traveling abroad and some for being comfortably comfortable with this currency. Now, the future outlook of Pakistan, briefly, is optimistic. Afghans are hardy people who have come through hellish environment. They have lived this life of terrible, terrible poverty for the last 40 years. We expect the period of uncertainty to be short and soon trade to resume. Peace and trade is requirement of not only Afghanistan, but also of Pakistan very badly. Thank you so much. I'll invite questions when the time comes. You're most welcome to ask. Thank you very much, Rudy uh, That was a very comprehensive um, and, and perceptive uh, presentation. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Major General Samrej Salik to, uh, to give his presentation. Before Samrej steps in, Farad, can I get one? I was raising my hand just as a host. Can I sure. uh, please ask a very quick question for Samrej Sub steps in? So also very provocative on your part to actually say that open borders and provide money, but that's precisely the thought uh, that I have. And in fact, it's something that I've actually tried to write about, but have been pushed back. So my question to you then, um, that's, a lot of studies were done on the impact on Pakistan economy because of the refugees that we have been sustaining, uh, what happened with, uh, post the Soviet invasion. Two learnings that where we went wrong, one was that we did not let the refugees integrate through proper IDs. In other words, they, we never, so the reason the black market rose is because we didn't allow them to get IDs, proper Pakistani IDs that say you are from Afghan. I mean, that's it. And today we are in more capable of doing this than anything. Second, we did not allow yeah. them to hold bank accounts in their names. If you can give this a one minute, and sorry for, for this, but I just wanted this to be very relevant. Thank you. No, I, I, I missed your question. What exactly is your question? Please, would you repeat it? My question is that given the registration system and the Nadra technology that we have today, would you support that, yes, open borders, yes, we disallow customs and everything, but we ensure that any Afghan that comes into Pakistan must have a registration card from Pakistan with the full ID name. And secondly, 
we immediately tasked the banks to allow Afghans to open bank accounts in Pakistan freely with that ID card. Amir, 100% what you said, I stand by that. 100%. I'll tell you why 100%. These people who have come that Asif has said 50,000 or some have come, how have they come? Whether they bribe people or they break the fence or they walk through the area which is not fence, they will come. Let's facilitate. Let's say these are five places where you can come, give them the documents and let them come on our strength. But do not let them do business all over Pakistan. Restrain them in areas. And preferably in Pashtun areas, they should not go south of Spizant at all. They should be in Pashtun areas. They understand the language, the clans are the same, the families are the same. And as regard Pakistan's economy, I think we've uh, lost the connection again. So I think we can proceed. I think, uh, Amir Saab, did you get the answer that you were looking for? Yes, Fahad, please, let's, uh, whenever uh, Rikesh Saab joins, we can have the Q&A later. Thank you for your uh, allowing me the okay. intervention. Great, thank you. Uh, Major General Samrej Salik is our next speaker. Sir, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, Fahad, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank organizers, that is PAID, Reenergia, and uh, BCPP. Thank you very much for affording me this opportunity to talk here. Uh, once I see the list of uh, ladies and gentlemen who are attending this webinar, I feel happy that there are some accomplished ladies and gentlemen. It may be a little hard for me to speak or uh, give out my thoughts. I should like to uh, begin uh, with the two prophetic statements of our uh, founding fathers of Pakistan. One is that Alama Muhammad Iqbal had declared or had called Afghanistan as the heart of Asia. So it is very important for a heart to function and provide pure, purified blood to the body. Only then the body can be healthy. Second statement uh, came from uh, our founding father, Qaeda uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who said that Pakistan is so placed on the map of the world that it is going to be the pivot of the word. Now, uh, relating uh, to both these statements, uh, it's highly important right now that the stability in Afghanistan is sought so that it provides that pure, purified blood to the body of Asia. Secondly, now it is being accepted uh, the word over that Pakistan is emerging as the pivot state of 21st century. Now, coming to what has happened in Afghanistan, uh, many are viewing this situation with interest, while many are viewing this situation with a lot of worries. I can say that uh, from here on, there can be an upturn as well as there can be a downturn. Uh, in many ways, it is uh, from Pakistan's perspective, it is a positive development because I say that whatever problems we may have or we might have in the future, are going to be of far lesser graver in nature as compared to presence of the US and India in, Af in Afghanistan. So we have to prepare for the downturn, uh, which is a possibility, and uh, there can be uh, increase in violence in Afghanistan, which will have uh, the impact on two neighboring provinces of Pakistan, that is KPK and Balochistan. We have to prepare uh, for the worst, and we have to be ready for the worst while we continue putting in efforts to have uh, an upturn. While I'm giving out my thoughts, I will keep comparing the, both the provinces, that is KPK as well as Balochistan, because in my view, uh, there, is a, there is a contrasting variation between the situation of these two provinces. Now, Balochistan has uh, gained uh, added strategic significance due to a China-Pakistan economic corridor. Gawadar lies in Balochistan, and major part of the CPAC is going to pass through the hinterland of Balochistan. So stability in Balochistan is highly critical as far as the future ambitions of China are concerned or China-Pakistan economic corridor is concerned. Unlike KPK, Balochistan uh, faces uh, a binary context. 
because uh, on one side, uh, Balochistan has uh, Afghanistan and, and on other, it has Iran. Lately, we have seen that uh, there has been divergence of interests uh, of Iran and Pakistan, particularly the statements coming from Iran on the, on the, on the capturing of uh, Panjshir. Those are little worrying. Uh, I thought that there will be greater convergence of interests between uh, Iran and Pakistan as far as the future environment uh, is seen in uh, Afghanistan. Now, because of that reason, Balochistan is a little different than KPK because these are the two uh, different countries which are touching uh, Balochistan. And uh, a problem in one country can also have an impact from another country, that is Iran. China, in my view, is doing bidding for uh, not, uh, I may not say that purely for the love loss for Pakistan, but particularly for its own ambitions. Uh, China has uh, whatever kind of threats that may be foreseen as far as CPAC is concerned, China is gradually putting in its efforts to, uh, to mitigate those threats. And that is going to be uh, something favorable for, uh, for Pakistan. Now, if I talk of the effects that might uh, emerge as far as uh, if there is a further downturn in the situation in Afghanistan, as far as the effects are concerned, I would say that uh, it has been discussed earlier also that there may be influx of refugees as of now, they may not be in greater number, but if there is uh, an increase in violence, of course, there is going to be a greater number of refugees pouring into Pakistan. And since uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, sorry, Balochistan is sparsely populated, particularly the border regions are not thickly populated. So it is easier for the, for the people to, uh, to shift from uh, Afghanistan into Pakistan. And very recently on social media, we have also seen certain clips where people are freely moving across the border. But once that thing happens, uh, there is going to be uh, socioeconomic stress on uh, already stressed uh, or uh, a little rested Balochistan. Unlike KPK, where there are, there are also going to be socioeconomic uh, stress, but uh, in Balochistan, I find that there is a very delicate balance of uh, coexistence of various communities. We have Baloch living in Balochistan, we have Pakhtuns living in Balochistan, and we have Hazaras living in Balochistan. Now, whenever there is, a, there is an increase in pouring in of uh, refugees into Balochistan, this delicate balance is, of course, going to be disturbed. And that is going to be a little different than the situation that might be might be in uh, KPK. Hazara factor in particular, I will I will like to mention because Hazara is a community which has uh, which has uh, faced a lot of uh, attacks uh, from uh, inimical forces. Uh, they have uh, they have had a very very bad times. Uh, one wishes that these things are not repeated in the future, but uh, if. Uh, Hazara community of Afghanistan is compelled to migrate. Of course, they are going to prefer coming to uh, Balochistan rather than going to any, any other area. Uh, there is a, a sort of uneasy peace in Balochistan and uh, uh, we keep hearing about uh, acts of terrorism. Once refugees pour in, of course, uh, then there can be uh, terrorists also pouring into, into Balochistan uh, in the garb of refugees and there can be an upsurge in, in the terrorism in, uh, in Balochistan. So now in my view, uh, 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 whatever situation, the way it is unfolding, uh, it's not a very, very, uh, very, very, uh, I would say a bad situation. It can take any ugly turn, uh, one cannot rule out. But I think, as I said in the, in the beginning, that it is better to have uh, whatever problems we might have as of now than having India or US uh, in our neighbor neighborhood. Bigger Gol uh, talked about a Marshall Plan. Indeed, there is a need of a Marshall Plan the way Afghanistan has been ravished because of repeated wars in the last four decades. But I don't, do not foresee it coming from the US. I foresee it coming from the neighboring countries 
which are affected because of instability in Afghanistan. In my uh, PhD dissertation, I've given an idea of uh, golden ring of security. That is the combined efforts of Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, which formed the golden ring to bring stability in Afghanistan. While the US has failed, I really wondered what were their real objectives. Did they want to have stability in Afghanistan or not? But it is the neighboring countries which will have to rally together to bring stability in Afghanistan. But Fahad had mentioned in the beginning that there has been an, uh, an, an, uh, a meeting of head of intelligence organizations of uh, brotherly countries in Pakistan. I think these are the measures which are in right direction. And the, the countries forming golden ring of security will have to join hands to bring stability in Afghanistan. And in my view, there is a greater probability of achieving these objectives rather than what has been uh, attempted by the US. So thank you very much. That's all I had to say, and I'll be available uh, for answering any questions towards the end. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> I think that was an important one. And I think you, the point that you made about uh, the demographics, I think that's very important. Uh, Dr. Meer Sadat Baloch, who is president of the Balochistan Council for Peace and Policy, is our next speaker. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Fahad. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, uh, it would be a bit, a bit hard for me to speak in front of uh, two of my mentors, Brigadier Agagul and uh, General Samrez. Aga Saab was one who appointed me as a lecturer in University of Balochistan and then sent me for PhD in UK. So I owe a lot to sir. And I ask sir to allow me to differ with him on few points, please. So uh, first of all, uh, we need to understand that uh, what, what is the situation in Balochistan right now? And uh, to put things in perspective, I just want to tell you a brief fact that in last three months, we had as many casualties of law enforcing agencies in Balochistan that we had in last three years. So from that, you can see that how things are going on in Balochistan right now. We are, as Agas have told, that we are very relaxed on the fact that there are certain proxies that were sitting in Kandar or elsewhere who, who were working against Balochistan and uh, uh, their influence might be reduced. But still, uh, there is a long way to go. And my focus will be mostly on the insurgency uh, that is happening in Balochistan. And I'll be talking about two factors, and then um, I'll go uh, towards the refugees and that what are the main concerns that uh, we as a think tank uh, that we have. First of all, um, I would like to inform uh, that uh, if we see the Hazara community as uh, General Saab talked about them, so the uh, Shia Hazaras in Afghanistan, they have uh, one militant group that goes by the name of Fatimiyun Brigade, and uh, you may be astonished by the fact that they already have their footprints in Balochistan for last uh, two years or so. So they are already here. So they are here in Quetta on one side. And on the other side, if you see that as soon as a suicide attack happened at uh, Kabul airport, uh, after a few days, we had an op. IPA, uh, IPO operation in Mastung in which we killed ISIS militant. And then right after that operation, uh, what happened that we had another suicide attack that killed our law enforcing agencies. So the impact on Balochistan is so uh, immense and so quick that uh, we need to be proactive in Balochistan, we, we cannot be reactive in, in, in Balochistan. And on one front, uh, uh, we can say that the government was uh, proactive when they reinstated the 12th core in, 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 in Balochistan, which, which covers the whole border, uh, starting from Balochistan going to KP. This was a very, very good decision, uh, keeping the security perspective. But then again, when we come to the intelligence perspective, I believe that the way that the intelligence apparatus is, uh, is working in, in Balochistan, we need to change that. Because what happened that three years ago, 
the insurgency of Baloch, it was headed by uh, Herbear Javed Mengel or uh, Baramtag Mari, as, as it was claimed. But right now, what happened, uh, as the theory goes, that you cannot continue, continue an insurgency for a long time of period. You need to change your stance. And what the insurgent, what they did was, they changed their stance and they all came together and they formed brass. A new, a new formation, which is which is there at, headed by Dr. Allah Nazar, Bashir Zeb, and uh, Abdul Nabi Bangul Zay. Now, all three people who were there before and they were trying to uh, wage a war in, in, in Pakistan, they are not in picture anymore. Now, the people who are in picture, they are Bashir Zeb, Dr. Allah Nazar, and uh, uh, Abdul Nabi Bangul Zay. And uh, now, what we are anticipating is that as Taliban, they have taken uh, um, uh, formed a government in, in Afghanistan. So it will be hard for Bashir Zeb or uh, uh, Bangul Zeb to uh, be there in Afghanistan uh, for uh, a longer time period. So they will certainly move towards Iran. And that is the right time when, when, when Pakistan should think that uh, they, should, they should make some uh, working relation on intelligence-based relation with Afghanistan so that we, we shouldn't let uh, those people that they, they should go in Iran and, and they should uh, use their land. And second, that thing that um, as uh, uh, Aga Saab and uh, General Saab uh, knows that uh, uh, the conflict, it has four stages and I'll not go into the all four stages, but in, 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 in Balochistan, we have never passed beyond, beyond the second stage. The second stage is where, where you go and uh, you use force and you try to uh, nudge uh, those forces. And then, then in the third stage, you go and you uh, start talking with them. And in fourth, then there is a sustainable peace. We, we need to cross uh, that uh, second stage and we need to go into third and fourth stage. But how we can do that, that is the question. And I'm sorry to say this, but but we cannot do this by appointing uh, uh, Shazan Bukti as one who, who should go and do reconciliation with, with Baramta Bukti or any other uh, person. Because in, in my opinion, Baramta Bukti or Herbiar Mari, they do not have any currency um, as of uh, today. And then uh, what we need to do is we need to engage the public of Balochistan directly because what is happening, I'm, I'm from Panjgur as uh, Aga Saab talked about Panjgur that in Panjgur and in, in, in Turpat, the insurgency is at their peak. What is happening there is that those people, the insurgent, they are getting intelligence from the public, they are getting sanctuary from the public and they are getting resources from the public. Resources, they are also getting the resources. And what, what the Pakistani intelligence or what the Pakistani government is doing, they're only busy engaging all the Nawabs and all the Sardars. For last 10 years, uh, we have engaged uh, the son of Khan of Kalat, uh, Prince Muhammad, and what he has done uh, for, for Pakistan, nothing. For last 10 years, we are patronizing that person. He has done nothing. And there are so many examples that I can quote over here. And sadly, what, what I will, uh, I see that in Balochistan, nuisance value has more currency than intelligentsia or intellectualism. See, we, we, we need to change that. Uh, and then once we have gained the confidence of the people, not the Nawabs and Sardar, of the people, because this insurgency, it is not being run by any Nawab of, uh, or any Sardar. Allah Nazar is not a Nawab or Sardar, uh, neither Bashir Zeb nor uh, Abdul Nabi Bangul Zai or any other person that is living there. So we need to create a new bridge because whenever I talk with the people who are sitting in the power and I say that you need to curtail, you need to stop going to these Nawab and Sardar, they, they tell me that this is the bridge between the people and the government. No, 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 we need to bring, build a new bridge, please. We need we need to do that, and after that, now if we if we see this situation of uh, refugees, uh, uh, first of all, we need to understand that at the moment, even those people that 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 they're living in Afghanistan, uh, uh, Durani Sab uh, Brigadier, uh, no, Ambassador Durani Sab, he said that there are fifty million people that are living in Afghanistan. But when I talked with uh, the representative of, of units CR, they told me that there are 40 people, uh, 40 million people living in Afghanistan. And out of those 40 million, 
ट्वेंटी मिलियन पीपल आर ऑन एड फॉरन एड यू सी दे आर लिविंग इन अफगानिस्तान बट दे आर ऑन फॉरन एड एंड दे आर ट्वेंटी मिलियन पीपल and we need to do something about it and what the international community has to do is that they need to look all the partners that are there by partners i mean either it is pakistan it is china or russia or iran who has stake in afghanistan they should be taken up looked upon only as a partner and nothing more and they should be allow and they should be help with to talk with those people to help those people that are there in afghanistan Uh, we are saying that if a refugee crisis emerges i am not concerned about, about the refugee crisis i am concerned about the crisis that can happen in afghanistan where 20 million people are on aid and we need to do something about it the next thing is the food security the people are not certain in afghanistan that either they will have their food the next day or 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 they will not have it so what happens is and it has been happening previously general saab also know because he served in balochistan that we have been smuggling our ration from balochistan to afghanistan hamare gandum the wheat has been smuggled from here the the rice has been smuggled from here and if that thing happens and it can happen because if we do not take those people into consideration their food security into consideration then this thing is going to happen so what we need to do is that we need to tell the international community to see their food security but we also so need to see that the... oh, all right know. all right just just last two sentence we need to see that the food security of people in balochistan is also not compromised because of this situation and at the last what i need to see uh, say is that no matter what we do is as long as the international community is there to support any militant organization or any militant ideology so pakistan cannot do anything so we request the international community that they should play their role positively in disengaging those militants thank you thank you very much uh, dr me sadat baloch uh, for your comments uh, the last speaker for today is dr jeffrey a stacy is a lead consultant at the un and former state department official in the obama administration dr stacy good evening and good day wherever you are watching it is very good to be with you friends first i would like to thank the organizers of this important discussion today i express my sincere regret that i'm unable to be in person in pakistan especially for the world class tea the really good food and of course all the socializing among colleagues i want to underscore that i speak today strictly in a personal capacity for myself alone not for the united nations not for the united states not for any commercial or private entity i speak only as a friend of pakistan of afghanistan of all of central south asia and a friend of all an enemy of no one as the other speakers have noted balochistan is of particular importance now more than ever the province has long been the home of afghan refugees pakistan has suffered repeatedly related to this now this notable influx is coming from the fighting in afghanistan and those who are fleeing the taliban rule it is important to understand the suggestion from our speakers that is a positive one from a local and a global perspective if the refugees who have been spoken of in humanitarian terms thus far in this discussion can be allowed a border that is not too closed and with increases in technology an ability for the time being for better integration and then over the longer period the ability to return home that has to be a goal that all of us share speaking of the taliban they're going to be now more difficult to influence 
now that they actually control the government and the state of the country, whether by Pakistan, Russia, China, Iran, Europe, or the US, even Qatar and Turkey, who along with the UN have the most influence at present along with Pakistan. These are the countries, the entities with the most influence and now the biggest challenge because of recent events. As of now, the Taliban are proving almost wholly resistant to American and Western influence. Now that the US and NATO forces have withdrawn, so went their leverage. A lot is being made of the West's control of ongoing control of billions of reserves. However, the Taliban have been less focused on what the rest of the world geopolitically has been focusing on. They primarily have been intensely focused on three key things. First, helping the Americans even so that they leave the country. Second, let's call a spade a spade, shall we today? They've been settling scores across the country, rounding up for repression all who worked either for the Americans, the Westerners, or the Afghan security forces, and any of the opponents that they've long held grudges against. They've been also focused on negotiating among themselves about the government that is partially formalized and announced, this caretaker government. And finally now, on the airport and getting it open again at Hkaya. We are well aware that the Taliban are more savvy in PR terms, and in certain measurable ways, they are in fact a somewhat more moderate group compared to their predecessors two decades ago. They have promised safe passage for all, amnesty for all, education for all, and a free press. All subject, of course, to their interpretation of Sharia, which has yet to be fully articulated. Naturally, well, or not naturally, it's unclear. But what we see is that despite the hopes that they live up to their words, thus far, they have yet to do so. Even while Western and international and regional cameras are present from news organizations around the, the world, they are even less likely to live up to these pronouncements now that the West is gone and their so-called inclusive government has been announced. The best way perhaps to assist Baluchistan is for the Pakistani government, the Qatari government, the Turkish government, along with the UN, to press the Taliban, in fact, to live up to Taliban 2.0, the image that they wish to project. If this can be achieved, much can be gained for Afghanistan, for Pakistan, for the region, and even the world. Pakistan can play the lead role in this effort both publicly and behind the scenes. It is already playing a major role due to the outsized influence it has in helping, having helped the Taliban take power. We need to call a spade a spade. With this increased influence and the installation of this government also comes increased responsibility, not only due to the refugees issue, as my colleagues have spoken about at length, but what we might also call surface national interests, quote unquote. It is in Pakistan's interest to use this influence to cajole the Taliban into living fully up to their promises. But it would be furthermore wise for Pakistan to take the lead in this regard from a global perspective. For by achieving results, with improved Taliban behavior, such a measurable positive impact will head off the likelihood of a fresh round of sanctions from the West. Pakistan has already been playing a lead role in persuading the Taliban to take the Doha peace negotiations seriously. Now it can supplement that success with using its influence over the new regime in Kabul to ensure that it adheres 
to the rule of law, enforces a strict adherence to human rights over the ranks of its fighters, its clerics, and its officials, and above all, prevent Afghanistan from becoming a newfound haven for scores of terrorist groups, beginning with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. With this success, Pakistan can work in particular with the UN, Qatar, Turkey, and at some point again, perhaps the West. But before that, regional powers and neighbors to fully stabilize Afghanistan over the medium term and use all the levers of external influence over the Taliban in the short term. It may be too much realistically to imagine, but ironically, success in this regard could actually approximate what actually would have been achieved had the last Afghan government and the Taliban arrived at a final peace treaty in Doha, well ahead of this military takeover. The rewards for Pakistan would be considerable. I can't help but recognize the significance of this day on 9-11. Perhaps we can discuss that more in the Q&A. But it is said that the era of American exceptionalism is now over. Around the world, people are questioning, did this happen because of the debacle of the American withdrawal from Afghanistan? Did it happen when former President Trump really began to use the reins of his power? Populism has spread all over the world as the new face of everything that is opposed to democracy, the rule of law, fairness, using the Rawlsian veil to make policies. And it makes a lot of countries, a lot of leaders, using a lot of energy to maintain Orwellian doublespeak. Just look at what happened to former President Trump having to speak out of both sides of his mouth about every other sentence. It is very difficult to keep this going forward. All countries have positive aspects, have negative aspects. It is important that the leading lights rise, shine brighter and connect with those lights across their borders. When we can achieve this as an international community, locally there in Central and South Asia, we will have achieved some success. We can, with the success, move forward to perhaps a new era of peace and stability. And with that, I join my colleagues in thanking you for your attention. I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stacy, for your for your words. Uh, <clears throat> we finished in good time, and we have a little bit of time for Q and A. And I know that we have a number of people who've raised their hands, but we've also had some people who've sent their questions. So I'll start with the first question that I, that I received uh, from Mr. Ayaz Khan, who's a freelance journalist. And his question is, um, and perhaps uh, uh, because he hasn't specifically named anybody for uh, to answer. So perhaps I could request uh, Mayor General Sambrez to address this question. Uh, and the question from Mr. Ayaz Khan is, uh, we have uh, broadly discussed tangible issues like security, refugees, economic, uh, uh, and so forth. The question is, how would we prevent a wave of orthodoxy creeping in as the common people in Pakistan were the first to celebrate the triumph of Khilafat in Afghanistan? How would this affect or reinforce the already persistent orthodoxy leading or contributing to militancy in the country? Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Fahd. Uh, indeed, a difficult question to answer because we have our own uh, uh, ideas or uh, thoughts about uh, what is the uh, orthodoxy, what is uh, primitiveness, what is uh, modernism, what is fundamentalism, and those kind of things. Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, 
uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, the Taliban, uh, it has been discussed, amply discussed, are not same Taliban who were in 2000, uh, 2001. They have transformed. And uh, uh, the positive aspects of the religion, definitely uh, those should be welcome. But uh, if uh, there's those kind of uh, practices which were, uh, which were seen in their, uh, in their last uh, tenure, I think those will not be will not be accepted by by enlightened people uh, in Pakistan, and I would say that it is the the majority is like that. Uh, uh, I don't uh, really fear any kind of uh, uh, that that uh, wave coming to Pakistan or uh, creating problem for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Uh, uh, Dr. Nadeemul Haq, I think, wants to uh, say something. Dr. Saab? Ji. Dr. Nadeemul, sir, please send me to. Sorry, thanks, Fahad. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. I'd just like to raise a couple of points. One is that I don't know why we in Pakistan are so concerned about Afghanistan. And Balochistan, for example, okay, you said Balochistan will be affected by Afghanistan. To my mind, almost all our problems are domestic. Because we get involved in foreign policy, our domestic problems are accentuated. It is because of our domestic policy that, um, that or in fact, because of our foreign policy as well as backed by uh, domestic policy that extremism took over in Pakistan. So that's the first point. I don't know why Pakistan is so concerned about foreign policy and so little concerned about a domestic policy. This is like the 256,000 webinar we've had in Islamabad on, on Afghanistan in the last few um, uh, days. And we continue to talk about Afghanistan and nothing about a domestic policy. So first question I'd like to ask all our people here the generals and the brigadiers and everybody that why doesn't domestic policy excite them? Why does foreign policy excite them? To Mr. Stacy and the foreigners, I'd like to say, the US is very steadfast and its thinkers are very steadfast in, in supporting their government policy. There was not a wave of dissent, apart from Michael Moore perhaps, on what US did in the last 20 years in the Middle East, knocking out seven countries, killing millions of people. And now once again, the US thinkers are sitting there and talking about Tom Friedman wrote an article about how the US should go after China. Mr. Stacey is saying Pakistan is it's responsibility of Pakistan to do more, do more. For God's sakes, Pakistan has done enough for the US. We should turn back. The US demonized everybody and created the war. The war on terror is nothing but US, a US fiction. I don't know where the terror is. The terror is the white terror in the US. There's no war on the white terror. There's war on the rest of the world and they're killing the rest of the world. It's up to the US to stabilize Afghanistan now. Running away is no good. Losing out, okay, fair enough, they've lost out. It's the US's job to stabilize Afghanistan, not Pakistan's job. So I would like to say, please folks, wake up. Pakistan should go back to its domestic policy. Stop following US thinkers who tell them, go fix Afghanistan. US should take responsibility for the 20 year war killing of millions of people in seven countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Daud Khan. Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It is Daud Khan, and uh, I am an undergraduate student going to start my final year uh, from 20th of September. Uh, and I also belong to the province of Balochistan. I am a resident of Durand Line. Uh, my question is that people talk about different issues on Afghanistan, but my question will be specifically about the influx of refugees. As Ambassador Durrani said, that almost 50,000 people have already come. I second his view because even in our own home, people, after the takeover of Taliban came in our home, they were requesting blankets, they were requesting even a piece of paper so that they can cover their bodies. But Along with security issues, the Balochistan people will face economic crisis. We say that the humanitarian crisis will rise in Afghanistan, but similarly, the local people, whenever they see such people, they are feared. 
apparently it might be shocking to everybody but Dr. it's a fact ask the question because we are short of time so what is the question and how can we is my question is towards ambassador dorari how can we tackle the influx of refugees in the light of our own economic crisis in balochistan due to high okay. poverty rate okay thank you ji uh, dr uh, ambassador dorani well thank you my friend that uh, if there's a crisis of refugees no one can tackle it you have i mean you can't stop them you have to tackle with them and and then i think the national community has to chip in and that is why then you have the united nations high commission for refugees whose mandate is uh, to look after the refugees we are doing that but uh, right now uh, the new crisis and the possibilities of new refugees uh, luckily the uh, it is not much uh, as was anticipated so still we can keep our fingers crossed that they uh, we won't uh, get more refugees but we have to be prepared for the worst thank you thank you uh, ambassador uh, we have a question from alina shah Uh, Mansoor, could you unmute Alina, please, and allow her to ask the question? Right. Alina, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Alina, we are short of time. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we, you can come later. Oh, back to you, Fahad. We okay, have okay. hands from Tarek Malik, Geopolicity, and Br Brahmash for your. Yes, let's take a question from uh, Brahmash Khan. Please, uh, and if you could keep your question brief, and also um, let us know who the question is addressed to. Hello. Could you please go ahead? Yes, uh, my name is Brahmash Khan. I'm a Fulbright Scholar. I'm doing my PhD uh, at Syracuse University, and I belong to KH Thurbad. Um, Mr. Agarwal said that the voice of Balochistan in terms of Afghanistan is good. I just wanted to ask whose voice, because the impact of every political action is bared by the ordinary citizens. So don't he think that by depolitizing the actual problem of Balochistan and by merging it with the problems of Afghanistan and its refugee is somehow alienating the political, social, and economic problems of Balochistan itself? Thank you. Ji, this is a question is addressed to Brigadier Saab. I think it was addressed to you. I think we lost him somewhere, but maybe okay. Asif Saab can take this question and also maybe, uh, you know, this is the same question, Fahad, as was asked by Nadim, the mixing of foreign and internal policies. So maybe we can give it to Asif Saab if you allow. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, am I audible? <clears throat> yes, you are. Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, these are we cannot separate them. Uh, 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 Bermash has asked uh, a very pertinent question regarding Balochistan, but what to do that Afghanistan is our neighbor? And uh, if we perhaps you were not born, but we have seen the Pawindas coming from Afghanistan up till uh, Sipi. and then they'll go back this was the tradition and then there are easement rights among the tribes who are divided on both sides of the uh, the border that also includes pashtun and baloch tribes because in nimroz province and uh, in our uh, chagri district uh, they they do straddle so this is a possibility and and uh, this has happened uh, over the centuries so you cannot stop that uh with regard to specific uh, issues uh, that uh, who is uh, uh, what has to be done that is the answer and that is you have to manage it and you have to manage as per your own capabilities if the the problem is beyond your capability then naturally the international uh, community will jump in and that is the answer otherwise Uh, it's not going to resolve, and then we can enter into circular argument. And with regard to Doctor Haksab, uh, Doctor Saab, by all means discuss your domestic issues. No one starts. Rather, 
uh, a foreign policy is a reflection of your domestic structure. So if uh, you have no credibility inside the country, no rule of law, forget about others respecting your, your country or the rule of law. So it is uh, by all means, uh, we have to uh, establish a rule of law based society in the country. And uh, uh, this much I can say, otherwise we, I can go on, but since time okay. is short. I think I'll, the yes. Thank you very much. Okay, next question from uh, Geopolicity. Fahad, may I say something? Fahad? G, 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 Jansa. Uh, uh, please forgive me. Uh, I just want to say a few words on uh, these two questions. Uh, with utmost humility, uh, for, I would like to address Dr. Nadeem ul -Haq. Uh, uh, I couldn't agree more that we should not be uh, involved in others' affairs. But the problem is that uh, we cannot be good boys in a match where others are not following the rules. If there is a match being played and one team follows the rules and others are not following the rules, then of course the one who is following the rules is going to lose the match. Uh, can we ask other countries also like uh, India and other inimical forces not to meddle with the internal affairs of Afghanistan? Only then we can be, we can, uh, we can stay aloof. Otherwise, that is, as it has been highlighted, that Afghanistan is the country which affects Pakistan the most. Two of our provinces are neighboring Afghanistan. Uh, any small thing happening in Afghanistan has an impact in Pakistan. So Pakistan cannot really stay aloof while others are playing their games in Afghanistan. Pakistan cannot really stay aloof because uh, it is seriously impacted due to instability in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Casey has uh, his hand up. Uh, did you want to add something? Oh, just to answer uh, the friend's question who made a very good point about interests of uh, various countries. I think he was entirely correct. Pakistan should not do anything except for its own interests, not the interests of the United States nor anyone else, but its own interests. That is the most sovereign element to any country's governance of itself and dealing with its foreign relations. And I, I believe that is correct. And also the US has made mistakes across the Middle East for not just 20 years, but for additional decades. And it's clear that the US, as he also pointed out, should be doing more, not just asking others to do more. I think that will just be taking place primarily in terms of humanitarian aid and safe passage for the time being, because the president is opposed to any other specifically over the board or even hopefully not over the horizon military efforts. And the American public is not in support of this either. But um, these points are important, especially for the interests only of each country. And that is what I support as opposed to ordering other countries around. Thank you. We have only a couple of minutes left. So uh, geopolicity, please go ahead. Yes, indeed, uh, esteemed friends and colleagues. My name is Peter Middlebrook. I'm the CEO of Geopolicity, a long-term friend of uh, um, uh, both Pakistan and Afghanistan. I have two, uh, two very short questions uh, addressed both to Nadim Mulhak, but also Asif Durrani. Uh, first question, the world blames Pakistan for the Taliban. Why? And the second question is, what happens if the Taliban fail to consolidate power? Everyone assumes that this is the end of history. It may not be. What is the plan B? Short and sharp questions. That's what you expect from Peter. Uh, okay. Dr. Nadeem ul -Haq is, uh, is he online? Sorry. Yes. I just want to say, look, I'm not saying that we should stop worrying about Afghanistan. But for the last 30, 40, 50 years, we have been concerned more about Afghanistan than Islamabad. <laughs> we have been more concerned about our foreign policy and the fact that India might get us there and we've let our domestic economy go to hell. Right now, we're going to face another crisis coming on very soon, and it is going to be an economic crisis. 
and we're going to be beholden to the IMF and international donors. USAID gives us a billion dollars and makes us fight uh, their wars. So we have to be very careful. We have to get savvy. I'm afraid I haven't heard that savviness from our audience, uh, from our speakers yet. I've heard that savviness from Mr. Stacy, who defends the US very well. We don't defend Pakistan. We are saying we are, we are making mistakes. The US has given us the war on terror, which is a very strange war as far as I can see. A war and an idea when they don't attack their own terror at home. The biggest terror the US has faced, we see that very clearly. It's from their own white nationalists who are now committing a whole series of crimes in the US. We hear nothing from all these analysts out there. Yet the world, and we have bought into that rhetoric too, that there is a war on terror. For God's sakes, Pakistan, stop buying into the war on terror and fix its domestic economy. That's my message. And I hope the general will take it to the army. Thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. I know there are a number of people who've raised their hands. Um, I would have absolutely loved to give you time, but we just are have two minutes, and we and Amir uh, Durani has to conclude this. So I am thankful to uh, all of you. Fahad, uh, do you want an answer to that question why Pakistan has blamed on Taliban? Uh, yes, uh, th thirty seconds, please. I will quickly say that it was accepted by. Uh, uh, Ms. Hillary Clinton, that uh, U.S. washed its hands and left the mess in Afghanistan to be sorted out by Pakistan, as I am talking of the time once Russia invaded invaded Afghanistan. It was ad admitted by her uh, by her herself. Now, in that situation, Pakistan tried its utmost to bring stability in Afghanistan. It tried Formula A, it tried Formula B, it tried every formula that that it could uh, manage to lay. And uh, uh, I think in that process. Taliban also came up, and that is the reason why Pakistan is blamed, that Pakistan was the one. But Pakistan had no other option but to try various formulas to bring stability in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for joining uh, joining us today. I think it was a useful discussion, a lot of very important points. I'm grateful, and I apologize to all those people who couldn't uh, ask questions. Um, Amir. Durrani, over to you for your concluding remarks. Well, first and foremost, thank you very much, Fahad, for moderating this. And I apologize to Sir, Sir Darzada, Tariq Malik, uh, Shahid, and a lot of the people who raised their hands. Um, before I conclude, I must say thank you to Jeffrey and to uh, General Sambrez, to Asif Durrani Sahab, Aha Gul, and uh, essentially to, especially to Sadat, and then also to Dr. Nadim for allowing this platform. But the conclusion that I think today, which is actually, I think, uh, going forward for me, I like the statement and it, has, it is still ringing in my ears. Are we being presumptuous? Are we gazing into the crystal ball rather too early? I think this was mentioned by um, uh, Gul Saab. Um, I think we are trying to be too provocative too early. Having been around, by the way, in university, not as a toddler, when the first invasion happened and I've seen it through the, the, the Afghan Jihad, I can tell you that you know, we treat today the situation uh, with much more speculation because of the omnipresence of the media and social media. And I think we also need to be cognizant of the fact that you know, this, this gives us uh, a tool, but at the same time, it also gives us a dangerous weapon uh, which basically people can abuse. Second thing I think which is still, um, I, I learned, and I'm sorry, I, these are the only two things I found really tr troubling. The other is, I don't see people saying and asking that very fundamental question, what if the Taliban will not control Afghanistan? I think Asad Durani Sahib alluded to that very beautifully in terms of numbers. And I think Asad also gave a very sharp analysis on 2020 economy of Afghanistan, the Taliban group uh, at 1.6 billion. So I think these are questions that are gonna trouble us. I think again, thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you Fahad for joining us and good night for right now. Inshallah, we'll get you all together. Thank you. <laughs>